Amen. Amen. Praise God. That was sweet. That was really, really sweet. It was cool. Uh, Sarah and Hannah have no idea what I'm teaching, but it was cool just how the Lord and His Spirit uh, kind of just lined up uh, some of the songs tonight. And so, uh, just I'm excited uh, just to be able to teach God's Word with you tonight and uh, really more than anything, share with you uh, what God's been showing me. And uh, so, a couple quick things I want to share with you. Uh, Pastor Jason, as he shared with us this past weekend, he is in England. And so be praying for him tomorrow, about 10 a.m. our time, I think it is. He'll be teaching there uh, Thursday night at Creation Fest. And so we can be praying for him as he uh, shares God's word. It is a festival, a music festival, and um, an evangelistic opportunity outreach where people from uh, really throughout London and or throughout the UK are coming to hear the gospel, to hear some great music, and by the grace of God, we will see people come to know the Lord at that event. And so let's be in prayer for, for him and Deborah as they're there together. And then as well, just a reminder, our women's team is in El Salvador still, and so they'll be back this weekend, but we can continue to pray for them as they minister there uh, that the Lord would use them and get them back safely here. We've gotten uh, just some sweet reports, both from Pastor Jason and uh, the team in El Salvador. So let's be praying for them. But without further ado, if you've got your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 tonight. Uh, Matthew 6, looking at uh, verses 22 through 34. Matthew 6, 22 through 34 is where we're going to be camping out. But if you want to give you a couple other spots, you can get your fingers ready or get a uh, little bookmark or a sheet of paper. I've got a few in here. If you need one, I can lend to you to mark your place. Uh, we're going to be in a few other spots. Matthew chapter 5, just a page or so to the left. We'll also be in James chapter 1. So Matthew 5, Matthew 6, James chapter 1. And then we will also spend some time you can put a bookmark in Philippians chapter 4. So Philippians 4, Matthew 6, um, and a few other spots, but those will be some good ones to kind of get you going, just to get your, your fingers ready and, and get a, a pen or a pencil and your notepad ready tonight. Uh, the t title of our teaching this evening is Every Light Has a Focus. Every Light Has a Focus. So if you've... Uh, Got your stuff ready? Let's go ahead and we'll just pray and uh, commit our time to the Lord, and then we will dive on in. Father, we thank you, uh, Lord, for this evening, and Lord, the opportunity that we have, God, to worship you. And God, I thank you, Lord, for the truth of the words that we just sung. God, as we put our trust in you, God, we will not fail, we will not falter, because you are faithful. Jesus, I pray that the worries that plague us daily, God, will just wither away. God, as we trust you. Lord, you are our rock, our fortress, and our strength, Lord. And in you, we will not be moved. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. This little light of mine... Come on, you guys know the song? Sing it with me for a second, all right? I'm not planning to do worship by myself here. This little light of mine, I'm gonna... You guys are good. This little light of mine, shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, you guys know the song. Well done. Come on, give yourselves a hand. All right, I know you guys didn't think there'd be a fourth song, but there was tonight, a little different. But you see, every light has a focus. And like this light that I've got here, it's got a focus. And hopefully I'm not blinding any of you, but as you look at the light, don't look too close into the light. Right now, it's got a broad focus. But now, it's got a more narrow or tighter focus. I'm going to turn it off, or actually I'm going to point it up so I don't blind you guys. But it's got two options. It's got a broad focus, and then it's got, again, a narrow focus. You see, either mode is focused. It's just a matter of what is it focused on? You see, what is it focused on? Well, if it's narrow, it's got a singular focus. Right now, I'm focused just on that back door. 
But as I broaden out the light, pretty much the entire back wall is lit up from where I'm standing right here. You see, a wide light, it's bright, but it's not as bright. A tight, narrow focused light is much brighter. And just as every light has a focus, every life has a light. Every light has a focus, but every life has a light. Yeah, it's Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus speaking to us. He says this, it's the Sermon on the Mount, a little earlier, about a page or two to your left. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see, I know I told you we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, but bear with me for just a moment. Let's unpack the who, the what, the how, and the why of what Jesus is referring to right now. He says, let your light so shine. So shine? Yeah, it's not just let your light shine. It's so shine. It's maybe a little extra shimmer or splendor to the shine of that light. You see, there's an emphasis when it says so shine. Not just, yeah, let, let your light shine. No, it's let your light so shine. You see that word there for let your light, in the original language in the Greek, it's lampo, L-A-M-P-O. And it means to shine forth, to shine brightly, or to shine out. And he's saying, hey, I want your light to shine out, to shine brightly, to shine forth in front of you. Why? Well, Jesus says, I want it to, to shine out that they, the watching world, those that are looking on at your life, that's the who that he's referring to, could look on at your life and look on at the light of your life and see. He says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Yeah, that, that word see there, it's with light illuminating or spotlighting something, you've got the ability to see in a way that you couldn't see before. You see, right now, as I bring the focus of this light down a little more, I can see under these chairs in a way that I couldn't see before, and quite frankly, I think I might need to clean up under there after service, because there's something under there. Maybe I'm going to look over here so that I don't see that. But when you illuminate light on something, you can see a whole lot clearer than you could before. But what is it that he says he wants the watching world to see? It says that they may see your good works, or as sometimes I say, your God works. I call it God works because I believe that there's nothing good that we can do unless God is working in us and through us. And that's what he wants the watching world to see. He wants them to see God at work in your life doing a work that only he can do through you. You see, that's what God wants the watching world to see in your life as your light, the light of your life, shines bright. Again, I'll say it to you. Every light has a focus, and every life has a light. So the question for us tonight is this. What is the light of your life focused on? What is the light of your life focused on? You see, if you've got your Bible, flip over a page, Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 24, we're going to pick up where Pastor Jason left off last week, but if you weren't with us, I'm just going to briefly recap. Pastor Jason, last week, he shared with us this kind of excoriating rebuke that Jesus made of the Pharisees. He said, hey, your actions, everything that you're doing, it's to focus the light of your life on yourself. It's all about you. You want people to see who you are, what you're doing, and how great you are. You see, they wanted their deeds to be highlighted so that people would glorify them as opposed to him. Let's pick it up. Matthew 6, 22 through 24. Let's read together. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. First of five points tonight is this. The Lord desires to be your sole focus. The Lord desires to be your sole focus. You see in verse 22 it says, the eye. There's a phrase there. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye. The eye is the gateway to your mind. 
It's the gateway to your mind. It takes in what you see, it processes it, and then it stores it into your mind. For most of us, it's through the eyes that most of what is in our mind has been processed. It re- it's been received through our eyes and then stored in our mind. Verse 22, it also says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, the root word for that, that phrase there is good, there's, there's two original meanings. The first is this, it's generous. It's generous, and I think Jesus used that word specifically because he's kind of going back and he's saying, hey, there was some generosity conversation that I had just a few verses ago in in, in verse 20 of chapter 6. He says, lay up for for yourselves treasures in heaven. You see, because as we're generous for the sake of God's kingdom, it brings light or joy to our lives. Because the Pharisees, they weren't so generous For the sake of God's kingdom They were generous for the sake of Well, having that light shown on them And he says, hey, I I want there to be The light, the eye the, The light of your eye to be good So that it's generous It's giving freely to others But the second definition is Sincere or healthy So is good The second definition is sincere or healthy Which means clear and free from obstruction You see, he wants us to have a single-minded focus on him and his kingdom. If our eye is healthy, if what's coming into us is healthy, there's no obstructions. We can clearly see him. Our focus is clearly fixed on him. We've got our gaze on our Lord at all times. There's no obstruction getting in the way of being focused on him. You see, there's this comparison and contract that that takes place between verse 23 and 22 where he says, being full of light in verse 22, and in verse 23, he talks about being full of darkness. It says, if the, the light of your eye is bad or being evil or wicked, it also refers to that as being unhealthy. Again, if a, if a healthy eye is free from obstruction, an unhealthy eye has obstructions. The obstructions might not be completely blocking you from what you're seeing, but they block you from seeing completely. They don't block you from completely seeing, but they, com- they block you from completely seeing. So again, if I, if I have this light here, I'm going to make it very narrow focused. Now, you can completely see the light, but if I put my hand in front of it, it's not completely blocking the light, but you can't completely see the light. You get the difference. You can see it, but not in completeness, though I'm not completely blocking it. You see, I don't know about you, but I've been to the optometrist or ophthalmologist, the eye doctor. I'm not sure what his right title or term is. Uh, I don't know if anyone does. If you do, shout it out. Help me out. Uh, Which one is it? I go to Dr. Henslick over here on La Paz, but I don't know what they are. Uh, So I go there, and I think we've probably all had that situation. They dilate your eyes. They put you on that machine, and what do you want to do? You don't want to fail the test. You want to make sure that you can see clearly. And so they got the different lenses. They're flipping it. Okay. Can you see better now or better now? Better now or better now? And and you're like, oh man, I, I, I think I can see better with A, but I'm not sure. Can I see better with A or better with B? And then they're better with B or better with C? And now you're just getting confused and you're like, are they tricking me? Is it the same one every time? I don't know, but that's how I feel. Like, literally, that's how I, and I'm like, uh, okay, I just want, just, I, okay, it's, it's umbrella, house, I'm like, just naming the stuff on the sign at the back of the wall, trying to make sure that I get it right, because I want to have good vision, I want to pass the test, and it's better, one, better with one, better with two, better with two, better with three, and, and I'm just not sure, because I can't see clearly. My eyes have been dilated, they've got this thing in my face, and I'm just concerned, I'm confused, I'm worried, man, I, I want to pass. Well, I feel like if we've got unhealthy eyes, that's how it is because we can't clearly see what's on the other side, what's on the other end, what what the Lord wants us to see, and that's Him. It's that image of Him that He wants us to see. I remember I was probably, I don't know, five or seven years old, and I went to the eye doctor with my my mom and my grandma, and uh, we were taking my grandma to the eye doctor because right? You go, you get your eyes dilated, and they tell you, hey, you can't drive for a little while, and, and uh, so my mom said, hey, we'll take, um, you know, grandma to the eye doctor, and, and then we'll, we'll drive her home, and it was during the course of that eye exam for my grandma that she found out that she had uh, cataracts and glaucoma, and at the time, you know, five, seven-year-old little boy, I, I didn't really know what those things meant, 
So I asked my mom in the car, you know, hey, what's this mean? What's the deal? And, you know, my mom told me. And, you know, as I've now kind of, you know, prepping for tonight, you know, remembered that story. Well, let me remind you, if you don't know, per our favorite doctor, WebMD, that we go to when we've got a concern, this is what glaucoma is. It's a nerve connecting the eye to the brain being damaged. It's usually due to high eye pressure. So the result, you've got this, this pressure on the nerve. So you've got your eye, this, this nerve that essentially is sending all the information to your brain. It's got some pressure on it. And because of that pressure, it can't see the way it should. And over time, that nerve is getting damaged. It's getting damaged, getting damaged, and slowly your vision is deteriorating. Typically, from what I understand from WebMD, a uh, really good source that we all trust, it's kind of irreversible. Now, a cataract, on the other hand, Again, per WebMD, it's a clouding of the normally clear lens of the eye. It causes blurry vision. It's kind of like looking through a cloudy window. But here's what can happen with a cataract. They can go in there, from my understanding, and they can kind of take those cataracts off and so that you can see better. They can remove that film, remove those scales from your eye, if you will, and now you can see clearly. They're a little different. One's reversible to a degree. The other, man, you're just going to continue to progress down a path, if you will. It's James chapter 1, verse 23. If you've got your Bible, flip there. As I considered this concept, this thought of vision, and what I'm putting into my heart, what I'm putting into my mind, what I'm focused on, it brings me to James chapter 1, verse 23. It says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And is not forgetful here, but a doer of the word. This one will be blessed in what he does. Verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself spotted from the world. You see, there's two people that are referenced there. The hearer, the one that goes to the mirror and says, man, something, something's wrong there, and walks away. Whether it's, you know, the hair, right? So my hair kind of looks decent right now. It's been a long day, but this morning when I woke up, it looked a whole lot different than it does right now. I was a doer, Okay. For, for you guys. Uh, I was a doer. I made sure I brushed my hair this morning. But there's that here that he goes to the mirror, and he's like, oh, that, that's nice. Okay, and I'm going to walk away. It's like the Pharisees. You see, they don't have their focus on the voice of the Lord. Their focus is on, on themselves and, and, and making themselves known and, and puffing themselves up, and, and they hear the word, and they know in piety what they should do, but do they walk it out? No, absolutely not. And then there's the doer. The one that the Lord is saying, hey, I want your eyes focused on me so that not only do you hear me, but you walk out to completion what I'm asking you. You see, the, the doer looks in the mirror and sees what the Lord is illuminating because the Lord is faithful to illuminate those things in our lives that need to be corrected and that need to be changed. And it's Jesus, he's speaking to us. He says, you see, right, right there, there's that, there's that thing in your life and I, I, I want you to have a clear, focused life on me so I can help you remove that. Because again, in and of ourselves, there's no good works or God works that take place. Jesus is saying, I know you can't see clearly on your own. Let me help you remove those cataracts. Let me help you remove those scales that you can't see that I can help you remove. He wants to be our sole focus. You see, his desire is that we listen to the voice of the master physician as he goes to work removing the scales of mammon or materialism that have taken your eyes off of being completely focused on Jesus. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Let's pick it up there. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, simply put, is materialism personified. Mammon is materialism personified. Some people have thought that, you know, it's money or maybe it was a, an ancient God. Simply put, for the sake of our time tonight, it's materialism personified. 
Jesus said in verse 21, where your treasure is, where your focus is, there your heart will be also. You see, I believe that many of us here in this room tonight, we're intentional to invest our money to see a return in this world. But do we make sacrifices with our money to serve Jesus? Jesus' desire is that we use the God of this age or money to serve the everlasting God. He says, hey, there's a God of this age, there's a God of this world, and it's called money. People bow down to it. People do and spend their entire life trying to attain it, trying to get it, and I've got nothing wrong with it, the Lord says. He says, the love of money there's an issue with. But he says, hey, I, I want to use that money for my kingdom, for my purpose. Let's pick it up. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. If is, li is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Second of five points is this. The will... The will, I'm sorry, the Lord will work out his perfect plans for your life. The Lord will work out his perfect plans for your life. So if you're a Bible student of, of, of any type, or, or maybe tonight I'm going to teach you something new, and you see that word, therefore, what do we do? We ask the question, what is it there for? What is it there for? And well, Jesus is saying, hey, he's saying, therefore I say to you. He's saying, therefore, consider what I just said to you. Consider what I just told you in verses 21 through 24. He's saying, consider this, and now I'm going to make it really practical. And my desire is that you apply it. Jesus says, hey, I, I know there's some things that are heavy on your mind, some things that have had your focus and are directing your time. Don't let the cares, the worries, the concerns, the priorities of this world be the focus of your mind and your time. It says there in verse 25, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about my life. I've got one life to live, don't I? Don't worry about my life. Well, that word worry there in the original language, couple definitions. The first is this, to choke or to strangle. To choke or to strangle. You see, when we worry, it will make you so uptight that it will make you someone different than who God created you to be. When you worry, you become someone who God didn't make you to be. He doesn't want you to worry. Your life literally changes the way you think, the way you operate. When you operate in fear, you're not living the life that God created for you. I believe that Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees when he says this. When he says, hey, hey, don't worry. Don't worry. I think he's saying, hey, I didn't make you to be perfect, but to trust me, the perfect and holy God. The Pharisees, they were trying to live up to this standard that they could never live. And I think they realized, hey, I can't live up to this, so I'm going to fake it till I make it. But they never made it. So they just kept faking it. But they were worried. Man, I, I, I've got to live this life. I've got to attain. I've got to do. We're never going to make it. I believe likewise, he's saying to some of us tonight, my standard for you is not perfection. It's to realize my grace is sufficient for you. My standard is not perfection for you. I know you're not going to make that. That's what he says. But I want you to realize my grace is is sufficient for you. Let's rest in that. Let's rest in the grace that he has for us. Let's not be worried of, of what we haven't attained or what we haven't accomplished or what we haven't done. For the Pharisees, the light of their lives was on themselves. When the light of your life is on you, the flaws and the cracks of your life are going to become evident. Just like when I was looking down there below that chair, I saw, man, there's some stuff down there. It shouldn't be there, but it's down there. We've got, we've got to get rid of that. We've got to clean that up. The Pharisees, over time, people are, when, the, when everybody's looking at you and you're directing that attention to yourself, over time, it doesn't matter how good we think we're wearing that mask, people are going to see through it. And people saw through the masks of the Pharisees. And Jesus is saying, hey, put the mask down. I don't want you to wear that. In contrast, when the light of your life is focused on Jesus, his grace and his glory is illuminated for the world to see. Let's have the light of our life focused on him, and his grace and his glory will be seen by all. You see, the de second definition of, of that word worry there is to care about something to the point of anxiousness. It will literally take the life out of you. 
You're so anxious, you're so worried, it's gonna just drain the life right out of you. You see, it was during COVID, probably many of you remember it, the government had a bailout. It was a PPP loan. It was three Ps. The PPP loan, the payroll protection plan. But God says, hey, I've got three Ps I want you to remember. He says, I wanna bail you out of feeling anxious. It's through prayer. It's prayer produces perseverance. Prayer produces perseverance. And the three Ps can be found here. Philippians chapter four, verse six says this, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Second P, 1 Peter chapter five, seven, casting all your cares on him for he cares for you. Third P, Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Let me say that again. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You see, just as the government had that PPP loan to get us through those tough times, the Lord says, hey, prayer produces perseverance. Call out to me and I will be there for you. I will be there with you no matter what you're walking through. Matthew chapter 6, 26 through 27. Let's hop back into our text Jesus speaking, he says, Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Third point is this. The Lord puts ultimate value on our lives. He's saying, hey, if, if I take care of the birds of the air, how much more am I going to care for you? We don't need to worry or wonder what's going to happen. He, he will provide all of our needs. Have you ever seen a, wor a bird worry about its next meal? Like just kind of fluttering around thinking, okay, how am I going to eat? How, how, how am I going to get my next meal? Where, where's that worm coming from? You know, where's that fish going to come from? No, you don't see that. You see, I've been in New York City. I've been in L.A. And, and in those areas where there's kind of nothing but concrete, nothing but cement, there's really not worms or, or, you know, organic material for those birds to eat. I see the world's fattest pigeons. The Lord provides for them. These pigeons are huge. It's like you think they're going to dive bomb on you and you make it out of the city okay. But the Lord provides for them. They made it. And the Lord says, hey, I provide for those birds. I'm certainly going to take care of you. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not me telling you you're excused from working, right? It was just the other day, last week, here at Camp at Coast, we were doing some fundraisers for a mission project in Guatemala. And so uh, me, my wife, and the kids, we did a little lemonade stand in our neighborhood. And we made some signs, and we, you know, did the lemonade. And about 30 seconds in, uh, I won't name my child, that was saying, man, this sign is just so heavy, I can't hold it up. And mind you, it was a, probably a piece of cardboard about this big. And uh, me and my wife realized uh, this generation of little guys uh, need to put in some harder work. Uh, and I, so I, I, I pulled them aside. I'm not going to say it was a he or she. Um, don't want to call them out. And I said, hey, uh, Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. And so here's the deal. Uh, you're going to eat tonight. Uh, I'm not going to not feed you, but the money that we're going to raise, if you can't hold your sign, isn't going to go to your pod. It's going to go to the other pod for the other, uh, the other group, all right? And so I know you want your money going to your pod so you win the prize. So they grab their sign, and they're ready, okay? So I'm, not, I'm all about hard work. It's not saying, hey, don't work hard, but don't worry. God's got you. He's going to take care of it, okay? Trust him. You see, the principle that we see here in verse 27 is don't let your focus be on things. Don't worry about them. God's got it. Focusing on them and worrying about them won't add anything to your life. In verse 27, it says it won't add one cubit to your height. One cubit is 18 to 24 inches. He says, hey, are, are, if you're going to think about being taller, I'm just going to will myself to being 18 to 24 inches taller. Not going to happen. Not happening. I'd love another one or two inches. Not happening. I'm not going to will myself to that. Another translation says that you can't add another hour to your life. You can't add another hour to your life. Job 14 verse 5 says, Your days have already been numbered before the foundations of the earth. There's nothing that we can do by worrying that we're going to make it happen by, because we've worried. To the contrary, the American Physiological Academy, really smart people, here's what they say. They've determined that worrying and having your focus on life beyond things that you can't control will have negative effects. 
And these negative effects kind of sound like the side effects from those commercials we see. You know, like you take this pill, you're going to feel great about this, but then all these other things. So it's depression, digestive issues, headaches, muscle tension and pain, heart disease, heart attack, high blood pressure, stroke, sleep problems, weight gain, memory and concentration impairment. That's what you get if you worry. You don't get an extra 18 to 24 inches. You don't get an extra hour of your life. Jesus says, hey, don't worry. You're not going to be able to change anything by worrying. Matthew 6, 28 through 30. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, they used it to cook, so it was burnt up, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? You see, the Lord wants to clothe you in his righteousness. So much more beautiful than anything that you can put on. So much more important than any outfit that you can pick out at a store. So why are we so focused and care about what we wear? Well, maybe sometimes. It's because our in intention is to get attention. Is your intention to get attention with what you wear? So that you can put the light of your life back on you like those Pharisees? See, I bet you those Pharisees, like, they had their tunic nice and pressed from the cleaners, you know, every day. They had, like, a fresh one they pulled out of the closet, like Steve Jobs, you know, that, that black, you know, long sleeve shirt and jeans. Like, you know, he's got, you know, I think he's passed now, right? But, you know, he probably had, like, a hundred of them lined up in his closet. I think the same with the Pharisees. They were always looking good, always looking sharp and spiffy. You see, Jesus, in verse 29, he referenced Solomon. And God gave Solomon a pretty unique opportunity Solomon was asked by God, hey, what, what do you desire? What do you want? He could have said anything. He could have said good looks, big muscles, wealth, fame. That's what I want, God. No, that's not what he said. But his request was to have wisdom from the Lord to lead the people of Israel with righteousness. He said, man, this is a tough, tall task that I know I can't do on my own. So Lord, I need your wisdom. I need to seek you. I need to be like you. I need to take on your characteristics because that's what really matters. You see, he wanted inward worth, inward value, not what could be seen on the outside, because that fades. I mean, I look at pictures of me 10 years ago. Shh, you should have seen me. I was like, you know, 185 and jacked. No, I wasn't. Not at all. I look just like this. Haven't changed that much. But you see, our, bu our beauty in the eyes of the Lord is not derived by what we put on, but what he puts in us and what he does in us. His focus is for us to be clothed in his righteousness, not the fading styles of Reebok, Roxy, or Ralph Lauren. Right? He wants us to be clothed in his righteousness. He doesn't care about what we wear. And quite frankly, the people around you don't care about what you wear either. He wants us to look like him. Again, Jesus is pointing out that he wants the focus of our lives to be centered around the work that he is doing in us so that he is glorified. As we wrap up, Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 through 34. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. It's not like he doesn't know you need it. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Fifth and final point, I know you guys are excited. The Lord will use his light to illuminate the areas he is working on. It's a long one. The Lord will use his light to illuminate the areas he is working on. Verse 31, again, there's that word again, therefore, and he's saying, therefore, Jesus is saying, therefore, for all the reasons that I've just given you, for all the, all the evidence that I just gave you, don't put your focus, the focus of your life, on the things that you can see. I've got you covered. I've got you taken care of. But here's where you want to make sure that my focus is. It's Psalm 139, 23 through 24. It's a Psalm of David. And I can kind of see David out in the fields, I think this is probably towards the end of his life after he's made a few royally big mistakes. And here's what he says. There's some humility you hear in this. Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. 
and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You hear the, the, the humility in that? He said, here I am. I'm a mess. I know I am. Search me, God. Because I know there's things in me that I don't even know are in me that are messed up that I know I need you to work on. And you might be here tonight and think, man, I'm pretty good. Right? We always use, like, I haven't robbed a bank before. Like, well, that's always kind of the example we give. Like, I haven't done anything crazy. I haven't stolen anything lately. Well, yeah, maybe you haven't. But I guarantee you, if you allow the Lord to search deep, he's going to find something. Because you're not him. And here's what he says. Verse 32. It says, For all these things the Gentiles seek. You see, he, he uses that word, the Gentiles, because he's speaking predominantly to a group of Jewish people. And he, he's using that word Gentiles to refer to them. He's saying, hey, the unbelievers, here's the things that the unbelievers focus on. Here's the things that they're worried on. And, it, and, and that word seek there, it's epizeteo. Epizeteo. Probably not saying it right, but E-P-I-Z-E-T-E-O. It means to seek after or to desire or to be on the lookout for. He's saying what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. He's saying the unbelievers, those are the things that they seek after. Those are the things that they desire. Those are the things that they're on the lookout for. What are the foods, the drinks, the clothes of your life that you seek? What are the things in our life that we are seeking after? And maybe we're seeking after them because we want to find fulfillment. We want to find value. We want to find importance. We want to say, man, I made it. What has the focus of your light, of your life, been on? Where's your attention? And maybe it's not something that you're stressed or worried about, but maybe it's something that it's like, man, I, I just got to attain this. I've just got to accomplish that. Maybe if you're, you know, a, a business person, it's, you know, I'm looking for a title. I'm looking for a promotion. I'm looking for that next raise. Maybe if you're younger, it's, man, I, I, I want, I got to make sure I pass that class or I, I, I pass that test or, you know, I got to have influence. What's my number of followers? I want to be, I want to be an influencer online, you know, like, I want, need to know that people are looking at me. What is the light of your life focused on? Do we have the same focuses of the world? You see, if we do, there's, there's something wrong there. Because that means that we don't trust him to take care of those things for us. Verse 33, there's that word again, seek. It's the same as in verse 32. And Jesus is saying, seek, seek first. Seek first, make Christ preeminent in your life. That word preeminent is to put him first in all things. The one and only thing that has your focus. He says, I want to be the one that has your focus. And when you seek him first, he will remove the weight and the worry of the other items. As you trust him, as you seek him first, all the other weight, all the other concerns, all the other burdens that are there, he says, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get them out of there because I'm gonna carry that weight. I'm gonna carry that burden. You see, it doesn't mean that that weight or those things go away, but it means that we are now in a place, we're now in a position when we realize that he's most capable to carry that weight and not us. You see, again, it's, 1 Kings chapter 3, uh, verse, verse 10 through 13, that's what Solomon said. He said, I, I'm not capable of doing this on my own. Lord, I need your wisdom. And what did God do? He gave him that wisdom and so much more. You see, church, I, I want to caution us for just a moment before we close. I want to caution us from following the ways of the world. And here's what I mean by that. The way of the world is seeking self-help or self-care. You see, uh, wor wordsrated.com says this. It says that over 15,000 self-help books are published in the U.S. alone each year. That's a whole lot of books just on helping yourself. Here's what I guarantee you. There's one book that was written some 2,000 years ago that will provide all the help that you need that has all the answers, the word tells us that it contains all we need for life and for godliness. But we find ourselves trying to read this book or that book to make ourselves the best version of ourselves. And Jesus says, hey, come to me and I will make you. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus says, seek me and I will fulfill all of your needs. 
You see, I don't know if you realize, but the thread there is seeking Jesus, coming to him. He is the source to those answers. Seek him first. Take on his characteristics. And through that, he will make you the greatest leader. He will make you the best dad or mom. He will make you the best coworker or boss. He will make you the best spouse as you take on his image. There's not another book you need to read, I promise you. Seek him. Seek his word. Take on his characteristics. It's not my words, it's his. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Take on my characteristics. Let me take on that burden and everything else will fall into play. Last verse. We made it. Verse 34. If you must worry, right? So let's read it there again. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Real quick, here's what it's saying. If you gotta worry about something, just focus on today. It's got enough things that you can worry about. It's right there. It's right in front of you. If you gotta worry about something, focus on that. Don't replay and rehash the past. I don't know about you, but there's some days that I do that. I lay in bed, or I'm just driving, and I'm like, man, what if I said this, or did I say that, or if I didn't say that, would it be different? I'm replaying and rehashing the past. Sometimes, I'm reviewing and rehearsing what's to come. And the Lord's saying, hey, just deal with today. Just deal with what I put right in front of you. And, and quite frankly, you don't deal with it. Let me deal with it for you. Trust me with it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, that you are, Lord, the God that says, come to me and I will make you. Come to me and I will give you rest. Seek me and I will fulfill all of your needs. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, uh, Lord, to, to fix our eyes on you. Lord, that the, the light of our life would be focused on you and nothing else. God, I pray that you would give us freedom from focusing on the physical things that are before us each day and focus on, Lord, you. God, putting you in the proper place. God, putting you in proper perspective as King of kings, Lord of lords. God, bigger and grander than anything that we could ever face. God, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to remove the weight that we carry, and that weight all too often sometimes is a mask. Trying to look, trying to perform like something that we're not. Something that you haven't intended us to be. God, you alone are perfect. God, help us to rest in your goodness and grace. God, we thank you. God, we thank you that your sole focus is for us. Lord, that you will work out your plans for us. God, that you value us, that you clothe us in righteousness, and that you will be faithful, Lord, to illuminate the things that you are working on. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, great to be here with you tonight. Again, let me remind you, if uh, you have a life group, they'll be meeting in room 101 or in the back. If you don't have a life group and would like to hop into one tonight, uh, you can either see Christina or Gabby or myself, and we'd love to get you plugged in. Uh, look forward to seeing you here this weekend at 9 and 11, and have a great evening. God bless you.